Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Today is time for a new weird sandbox survival game Once Human to be reviewed on this channel. I'll talk as usual about all the game systems I discovered in the 45 hours I've played the game, often giving tips and all the good stuff you might be interested if you didn't play this yet but are curious. Stick around if you are uh, not a Rust player or someone overly concerned about his data. Game loop. Surviving in a post-apocalyptic world filled with zombie-like creatures and other abominations is the name of the game in Once Human. The core gameplay loop revolves around scavenging for resources, crafting essential items, fortifying your base and defending it against the Divines and the enemy factions. It's a familiar formula but executed in a way that keeps you engaged and constantly on your toes. <laughs> well, uh, last part is not really true, but we'll go over that later in the video. The gameplay in Once Human is a well-balanced mix of exploration, combat and crafting. The combat mechanics are satisfying for the most part with a variety of weapons at your disposal to dispatch enemies in different ways. The crafting system is deep but not as deep as I'd like and allows for a lot of customization giving you the freedom to tailor your playstyle to your liking. The game is pretty simple. You progress by going around settlements and activate rift anchors while scavenging for loot and battling foes. Activate enough of those and you'll be able to fight a boss every 10 or so levels. In between, progress through your tech tree and try to make your base look like a normal house. <laughs> Please, just try it for once, whatever. Again, we'll talk more about this later. So this is the condensed version you'll get by watching an IGN review. But here at Defensive Games I'm about telling you as much as I can about a given subject. Without spoiling it of course. And luckily there is nothing to spoil so <laughs> let's dive a bit deeper into it. Each area is controlled by a faction. So if you go activate a reef anchor in a Rosetta controlled zone you'll find a high tech base well defended with walls, watchtowers and autonomous turrets. If it's vultures controlled area you'll see mad max like settlements built from scraps on top of what was already there you know this was a port for example pretty cool if you ask me and finally divine controlled villages and towns are creepy with spore like formations growing inside the houses and the best time to hit one of those places in where it's dark of course for extra creepiness the friendly ones as far as i saw are mayfly and the union and the enemies are divines of course rosetta and vultures there should be more factions but this is what i discovered so far once human draws inspiration from games like borderlands state of decay daisy and shrouded and powered but it manages to carve out its own identity with its within the survival genre it captures the same gritty survivalist feel of those titles while trying to add its own unique twist with the post-apocalyptic setting and the threat of the grotesque monsters and deformed mutations of unknown origins that dominate our world Devs took blueprints from other games, but sadly they didn't innovate much. I will elaborate more on everything in later parts of this review. Difficulty... <laughs> well, let's say this game is not hard. And that is a problem for me, at least. Listen, I'm not a masochist or anything. I don't want to die every 10 minutes or so. But I want to fear for my life in these types of games almost all the time. Even after level 30, I still feel the world poses almost no threat to me. Perhaps in later phases this will change, but... I, I'm talking about how I think it should be from week one here. Outside of the tutorial zone, I should fear for my life in all places, not only the big boss we fight each 10 levels. Or the old place that has some tricky elites you don't know how to kill yet, or a cool mix of enemies. I haven't died once outside those boss battles, so yeah, I don't think it should be like this. The world of Once Human is very big and there's hid plenty of cool stuff for us to find. But because it's that big and for the game to run decently, which it does, they forced LODs pretty close. The LOD is level of detail mesh, basically. It's it's when the mesh changes from high detail to lower detail to lowest detail and so on. The games do that in order to boost performance. They forced LODs pretty close. So when you ride around on your bike, for example, you'll see all sorts of 
objects pop in from plants to entire houses. I mean, I know this is not scum, but the world should feel 10 times more dangerous. And not only about POIs, by the way, make packs of NPCs roam around the world. It would be cool if some, some of the factions would even attack each other. That would help uh, us, the players, in two ways. One, make us shake that uh, main character of the story feeling we tend to get in every damn game. Yeah, and the world would feel more, I don't know, alive. As it is now, between points of interest, you can go AFK, with no worry in the world. Sure, in some parts a pack of wolves can get you, but that's pretty much it. In said POIs you fight all the time and it's mostly cool, but the second you exit the village is empty again. Only you, trees, some rocks, resource veins and some game for you to hunt for meat and hides. Basically, the entire world outside of those missions areas is an oyster for you to stuff your face in and... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, some things shouldn't come out of my mouth. So yeah, the world is pretty cool, but it's a missed opportunity. Note, I have no clue how this will evolve in later stages of the season. I just know it will evolve in some ways. But I got some sort of cooldown on some of activities I could do. But yeah, I don't know because my progress just stopped. And I die if I try and go to Tall Grass location, which is my next storyline quest. Uh, this is not open yet until the next phase that starts tomorrow. Or perhaps today by the time I post this video. At least from that phase on, the entire map is unlocked as far as I understand. I might be mistaken, I don't know. The pretty cool thing about this game, it has a seasonal progression. And this leads nicely into the progression in this game. This is one of the big differentiators from the other survival games. It has a seasonal structure that unlocks in weekly phases. So the season storyline evolves over the course of 6 weeks. And after that, rinse and repeat. This rubs some people the wrong way, but I suspect some some of them don't really understand what's up. We are aware that many players are concerned that their in-game progress will be reset in 6 weeks, but we are here to reassure you that this will not happen. We value the time and effort you put into this game so the items and gear you have obtained from the seasonal scenario will be retained in various ways. This is what the dev said. So yeah, let's wait and see what will carry over and what won't before making a riot, shall we? I'll hate to start over from scratch myself unless we are talking about a new experience that justifies it, you know. If devs pull this off, it will be cool and will keep us engaged each six weeks. So yeah, there's a list of stuff they say will stay with you when the new season starts, but I won't go into that. And it looks cool in my eyes, you know. So this is not a total reset, but just enough to challenge you with the new content each season, because they will introduce new seasonal objectives and gameplay mechanics, which vary depending on whether you are on a PvP or, or a PvE server. Itemization is great. Not perfect of course, but great nonetheless. Every weapon feels good, but with the ammo scarcity, the truth is I enjoy crossbow, bow and sniper rifles the most for obvious reasons, you know. The armor is also nice. It looks cool for the most part and the existence of gear sets in this game lets you build the character nicely. To top it off, you can also mod your weapons and armor. Weapons tier level determines what materials are used to craft them and their overall stats and level requirements requirements, you know, ranking them from tier 1 to tier 5. Each tier unlocks at each 10th level, tier 2 at level 10, tier 3 at 20, etc. And there is another layer of upgrades called calibration. That thing is pretty neat as you don't change gear like socks. If you get a cool item with uh, nice rolls, you will keep it for a long time, if you craft it that is. The found items become unusable when the durability reaches zero, as you can't repair them, you know. When that happens, you can disassemble the piece, getting some value out of it, and sometimes a blueprint. Sometimes you are rewarded uh, blueprint fragments of a piece of armor or a weapon. Mods come in different rarities and can be disassembled and enhanced. They give weapons and armor a bit more customization depth. 
you will disassemble a, a lot of mods so it's a good idea to lock the ones you want to keep by pressing the C beforehand. This is the part I will hate the most with this game. So let's get into it. When you start building up your base you realize there are a lot of things to build. Under structures you find the base building blocks namely your foundation, ceilings, walls and roofs. They all come in different shapes, sizes, some things are upside down, some are convex shapes, some are concave, etc. Then you have all kinds of stairs and the last tab deals with doors, windows and balconies. All good so far, right? Yeah, pretty cool. Where the base building falls flat for me is when I try to build the walls and realize the shapes don't combine that well or you can't get a certain look because the game lacks the required modules, you know. Or this is the cherry on the top, the snapping is buggy and simply doesn't work on occasion. Oh, and when, uh, if you make something and you delete the wall supporting it, it all vanishes and that sucks. Enshadowed has the best or one of the best player housing system I've seen. I reviewed that game earlier this year by the way. So I wish these developers would at least try to come up with something new. Like I don't know why only build up, go down for once, make a basement with 3 levels you know. Well <laughs> I know why you can only do this in voxel games because it's a difficult task to make holes in the ground at runtime. But yeah I'm sure there is a way to do it, just look for it you know, innovate. Anyway, the second main tab deals with all sorts of facilities that help you produce and refine stuff. I'll not even get into those workbenches because it will bore you to death. So first tab is production processing, the second one deals with storage, the third with combat turrets, traps and defense structures, then function facilities where you'll see those aquariums that are used to store your pals. <laughs> I mean divines, among other things. Then you have power facilities that consist of solar generators and all kinds of poles and switches. Then you see furniture uh, that is pretty self-explanatory, prints that are basically skins for your house. For example, you can see my floor is shiny. Uh, that's because I unlocked dark cement flooring at some point and applied it to my wooden floors. And finally, house blueprints, where you can save your house so you can move it. To move your entire house, uh, pick a spot and as long as you are not near a road or other territories, press B to enter build mode and then press Z. And then you can just move your entire house that way. I strongly encourage you to move often as you progress. I made the mistake of staying in the starting area until I got level 25 for no reason. And this is it with the building. As I said, it feels half fast when you actually try to do something that involves at least a floor and has a more complicated shape. The lack of modules needed is annoying and makes you just leave it the damn thing be, not giving a damn about aesthetics. And I think this is the entire point of player housing, am I right? Aesthetics. And let's just say it needs to look cool to be fun. And the fact that players can build anywhere they want, <laughs> it's very annoying because you see abominations everywhere. Take a look at this for example. This is my base right at the starting area. So when you land, if you're a new player, you could see my creation in all its glory. First thing, yeah. So devs, please do better with this. I'd give this feature a 4 if I was to rate it. I need more modules and need smart contextual snapping just look at enshrouded for starters that game has good base building and that's it and just give us better options for dealing with wires for el electricity and tubes for water storage for the love of god first thing let us build those poles even on the ground why do i need to build them only on a foundation i have no idea deviations are like pulse often cute little creatures that help you in two ways in combat or back at base with chores. Pretty cool. The combat divines have abilities and you can summon them from time to time and they'll cast that abilities for a short while. As simple as that. And the ones that I like the most are the territory type divines. They offer passive gathering materials or create exclusive materials for you to build special items. For example, Harvest Seed produces hard vine and you can use that to create living armor, useful during boss fights. There's another one that lets you create an item that repairs your gear and so on. Pretty cool stuff. These divines look cool and while they are not really consistent with the world, 
they look good and are very useful to have so unlock them as fast as you can and you can have multiple ones of the same type by the way oh, and some of them are boosting your crafting for example this fiery frog sits on my furnace every time i queue something in there reducing the smelting times Anyway, you got the idea. These are great and can be found doing stuff in the world, obviously, sometimes they just float randomly in certain places. So every time you see a floating bubble, go near it and press F and pray you get it. It's simple. Random thought, the cradle with the creature inside reminds me of Kojima's Death Stranding. So to conclude the biggest chapter of this review, the gameplay is good, but the lack of difficult encounters besides the occasional elite monster that has only hard because I didn't know how to deal with it at that moment in time makes you don't want to take this world seriously. And the world outside of the towns or villages lacks a soul. The occasional wolf or boar that attacks you while you pick up flowers doesn't count. So for this, I'll rate the gameplay section of the game with a 7. Fix these two things and it becomes a 9 for me. Just add random patrols of any faction roaming around and random camps. Add groups from all those factions that fight each other randomly etc. Everything will add to the experience and the world would feel a lot better. So the moment is a 7 but should be pretty easy to fix. What did it? Blah. Monetization is great. Considering I come from the other free-to-play game that just released, the first Descendant, well, that game has a very aggressive monetization model, making me not want to buy a single thing out of principle. This one is very relaxed, with a free battle pass that rivals the paid one, in my opinion, and with... Guys, get this. <laughs> if I want to buy a skin, for example, the first cool thing I see in the shop, it costs 2,280 Christian. Okay, that's the premium currency. If I click buy now, it lets me buy it straight up. How cool is that? And if I click other amount, it opens the currency pack page and look, look at this. This pack gives you exactly 2,280. Oh my God. So it's possible, huh? Good to know. Good to know. For this exact reason, I'll get something from the shop because I want to encourage these kinds of practices, you know. So without going too deep with everything in here, you'll see sets, individual items, hair and makeup, cradles, team packs, weapon skins, a cool territory pack that makes your base out of metal and glass, the usual bullshit pass and so on. Prices are okay and that's pretty much it. Monetization score is 9 out of 10. This is a first on this channel. Uh, no, uh, Helldivers had this too. It's nine because this game needs a way of getting some premium currency while playing the game. Not much, but enough to buy an item or two per season. Just like in Helldivers. Graphics. Well, this is where the game shines, for the most part at least. It has great art direction. The divines take inspiration from the Last of Us monsters with spore-like formations growing from the inside and somehow equally it Reminds me of uh, parts of the upside down world in Stranger Things. Good texturing, animations and lighting. The textures are a bit low and the mapping is not the best I've seen. For example, in this frame, the stairs look like shit. Then, the de then this decal is floating, then this one is being cut at the corner and makes no sense to be over the window frame as well as the wall. If you stop and look at these kinds of things and want to be anal about it, you'll find a lot of issues. A lot. Luckily, I'm not going to do that today. Just know the following and after that we talk about the good stuff. Textures are a bit low, the game is not polished enough, collisions of the ground and especially around train tracks makes riding your bike a hot mess sometimes. And sometimes I saw the last LOD being displayed when I was close to those buildings. Usually at that distance the highest level of detail mesh is displayed, in that case it was the other way around, you know. And talking about LODs, they are very aggressive. When riding the bike especially, you see stuff popping up all the time and it's distracting. I think only in Black Desert I saw so bad LOD management. Look at this, I go 20 meters away from my base and the lights just vanish. Come on man, really? Anyway, enough with that. The environment has very good beats and the game is very atmospheric. Meaning at the perfect spot, weather and time, you'll be surprised with how good the game actually looks. And the character design and execution of the 
of those characters in this game is top notch. I'm talking about enemies here, as most of your friendly NPCs you interact with are kind of meh looking with bland animations, you know, and dead eyes. The vines are just mm, beautiful. Rosetta are a bit dull and generic, but I appreciate the colored lights on their helmets that make me spot them from afar during the night and know what type of NPC they are. Not that it matters anyway, they get one shot. And vultures are just anarchist punks on crack, to be honest, I like them and they remind me of Borderlands. Now, the bosses in this game are mm, chef's kiss again. There was a lot of work put into these chaps for sure. They are impactful, scary looking abominations. From the intro cinematic to the fight, I enjoyed every one of them. Please, I want more. I want more bosses. I want, I want to fight them often. I want twice as many bosses, guys. Twice. Every five levels I want to fight a boss. A boss like this. They are great. These guys are varied enough with great telegraphed abilities, so uh, as far as I can see, I only fought three bosses so far. I don't know how many uh, there are in the game. The world bosses are not active at the moment, uh, but I can't wait to see how the season progresses and how it will change the environment and encounters. Despite the fact that this game's graphics are hit and miss, I'll give it a solid 8 because of the atmosphere alone player armor and weapons and creature design. Improve on things I mentioned and it should be an easy 9. But that's a lot of work, I tell you from the start. So yeah, good luck with that. The sound, I'll keep this easy and short. Sound is great. The environmental sounds are well placed within the world. In a swamp, it feels like a swamp. In a forest, it sounds like a forest, you know. It's 9 out of 10 easily. And it's 9 only because of the lack of the voice acted dialogues. Come on guys, you have some just add them for every dialogue in the game now. Yeah, so... Chop chop. Should be easy to do. Most people can be asked to read anyway. You made me skip every dialogue with without the voice so far. Oh, and my usual silent protagonist rant. I, I must say it every time. In third person games especially, I feel it's pretty dumb to not have you fully voiced in dialogues. So remember the 9 out of 10 rating? <laughs> Make that 8 out of 10. Yeah, I just changed my mind. This is all highly subjective, yes. But it's how I feel and you're here to hear my thoughts, right? Performance is good. I get constant 160-ish FPS. I had no crashes, no stutters. Specs in the video's description. Decent loading times. Not many loading screens anyway, since this is an open world after all, you load only when you go into a dungeon or have a boss encounter and when you teleport around of course. The menus are pretty slick, but the UI is a bit too crowded for my taste. The right part of the UI is crowded with the action bar, weapon, ammo and two useless icons that should go away. And the left side is filled with a bunch of useless chat windows I never use. And the mission tracker. The chat window annoys me, to be honest, the most. Just make it fade it out, you know. When when I want to use it, I press enter, it pops, it pops up. When I type my stuff, I press enter, send a message, it fades out and stays out until I press enter again. It's it's pretty easy. Just do it. Make it go away. So the UI is pretty polished, other than that, no issues with how each element looks by itself and how it conveys the information to me. The menus 
are very cool though. I don't feel the free to play bloat as much as in other games. Wherever I go, I can see what's up at a glance. And I especially love the presentation in the field guide. That's a fancy wiki inside the game and I strongly encourage you to check it out as it looks pretty cool. You can see every foe in there but the bosses for reasons. The journey rewards you with XP and very important currency you'll need for upgrades and crafting energy link. All in all, I'll give this an 8.5 out of 10. Now the conclusion. In the last review I used the scores to make the to make an average and I realized afterwards that logic is bad because the gameplay weights more than menu and UI for example. So I'll go back to giving a score based on what I think is fair for the overall game disregarding the scores I gave so far. Those are there only for you to make an idea on how high I value something from 1 to 10 compared with what we are used to in from other games you know or what we expect but it's impossible for me to come up with a good formula to use all those scores because i don't know that kind of math so i think this game is a solid 8.5 out of 10 it all depends on how it evolves the next couple of weeks it can go it can go up or down from here i'll keep you posted as i plan to make more videos about it perhaps even a guide or two Good game loops, good presentation and performance, you feel zero friction because free to play. This is the first of this kind in a while. Anyway, do your own research if the data and PC security concerns you. I'm not, to be honest. Everyone farms your data. From the companies you pay your bills to, to Adidas and Nike and to Blizzard, uh, Microsoft and Tencent, everyone wants it, all sell it and it is what it is and the anti-cheat is not kernel level at least so yeah i don't know what to say i talk more about anti-cheats in this review by the way so yeah it's free try it you might like it overall once human is a solid survival game that checks some of the boxes of fans of the genre if it gets a bit more challenging i'm sure it will take all the boxes. With engaging gameplay, cool visuals, immersive atmosphere and solid performance, it's a title that's definitely worth checking out. So grab your weapon, fortify your base and get ready to face the divines in once human. Happy gaming survivors.